follow the common service order from page 15. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. We pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the weekend is recorded by the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 2. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. And as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. 
And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is God's word. The psalm appointed for this weekend is Psalm 143. The music is on page 118 in the front part of the hymnal. We'll sing together today. <clears throat> The second lesson is Paul's words recorded in 2 Corinthians 12. In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is God's word. Alleluia. Happy are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and true heart, and bring forth fruit with patience Alleluia. We stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is recorded by Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, 
among his relatives and his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. This is the Gospel. We join to confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. The hymn of the day for this weekend is hymn 536.
grace and mercy and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Message this weekend is based on the second lesson of the day as God inspired Paul to write in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You may be seated. <coughs> name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. When you think of Paul, what comes to your mind? He had a pretty amazing and very, very interesting life, didn't he? When we first meet Paul, he's not Paul, he's still Saul. He's at the stoning of Stephen. The people that were getting all worked up to stone him, they had to take their cloaks off so they could wind up a little bit more and throw the, thro throw the rocks a little bit harder and faster. So they took their cloaks off and they laid him at the feet of Saul, who was approving of everything that was done. And all Stephen had done was say, this is the message of Jesus. This is the same message Jesus himself spoke. This is the message the apostles were speaking. Stephen was blessed with the same faith, the same opportunities to speak and share the message, which he did. And the response of the religious leaders, he's got to die. And Saul is there with his approval. And we know that Saul, his own words, that, that God did have him write. If you and I were writing the Bible all on our own without being inspired by God, we probably wouldn't write everything God had us, would have people write. I mean, if you were King David writing the Bible, would you write all that stuff with Bathsheba and Uriah and everything else? We kind of leave that part out. We, we leave all the bad things about ourselves out. If you're, if you're Saul, you'd probably just leave out the parts before he came to faith. But God had him write. Remember who I was in my previous life. He was advancing in Judaism far beyond his peers, far beyond anyone his age. Now, people were amazed at Jesus, too, when he was 12 years old in the temple. They were amazed at his questions. They were amazed at his answers. And by no means was Saul Jesus. But people were also amazed at the education and the intellect of Saul. And advancing in Judaism advancing in the ways of the Pharisees as as he was proud of at that time meant he was all about the law he was the one you went to if you wanted to know is this right or not all the the sports that I ref for, for high school there's always one person in the state you contact first if you have a question about the rules they're basically the best ones for the law <laughs> and they know the rules and the laws better than anybody else so if you're wondering how to apply something, if something's right or not, you ask them. That was Paul in a, in, as Saul in a religious sense. If you wanted to know how to please God, you ask Saul. But what were his answers going to be? What are you doing? There really wasn't a cross anywhere in anything Paul did as Saul, as Pharisee. And he was very, very, very zealous for that. We know he's going. he wasn't satisfied just imprisoning believers in Jerusalem. He got authority from the political leaders to go all the way up to Damascus, 100 miles away. If I can find anybody there, can I imprison them or even kill them if they really deserve it? That's Saul. And then on that way to Damascus, we know what God did. I blinded him for a few days. He said, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Not the people. You're against me. You're not really against the people because they're just presenting what I've given them. By your actions, you're opposed to me. And then as zealous as Saul was to persecute, he became even more zealous to preach, didn't he? So maybe the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Paul is, that man spoke to a lot of people, didn't he? He traveled. He didn't have all the conveniences we have now. He didn't have all the technology we have now, by no means. But how many people did God allow him to come into contact with? And he writes all these letters in the, that God still has for you and me to write today. And, and there's a, a wonderful feeling that you have when you present the gospel to somebody and you can literally see the piano lift off of them. You can see the weight lift off of them when they realize it's not what I have to do. He did it all. I don't deserve it. But he, in love, said, I'm not going to leave you that way when I can do something about it. And he'll do everything. And he forgave. And when you present that message 
and you see the faith that God puts in someone's heart, that's a wonderful thing. But that wasn't the only thing, Paul. As we also know, the, pro the problems Paul had, times that he got mistreated by people, times where he and some of his other workers, he and Barnabas, didn't always see eye to eye, and they ended up separating and going different ways, still presenting the gospel, but the two of them weren't going to do it together anymore. They were going to go their own ways, and certainly his enemies did whatever they could to him. And we know he was shipwrecked, and we know he was stoned, and we know he was beaten, and he was in prison, and he finally appeals his case to Caesar. That's a full, full life, isn't it? But is it really Paul that we remember, or is it what God did to and through Paul? It's really that, isn't it? Because what God did for Paul, he's done for all of us. He took this one who was set on himself. That's the sinful human nature of everyone now. My talent, my ability, I'll do something good enough. I'll make this right. Can't do it. It's God coming to us. And just as he converted Saul, he converted you and me. And we have that same peace. Not really valuing, and we're not, we don't have a statue of Paul outside. And when you have windows of Paul or other apostles in the church, not that you worship and honor them, what did they say? And that was Paul. It was all of him. And then it became, can I tell you about Jesus instead? So when you think Pastor Wolf's retiring this weekend, when you think of him, what comes to mind? Think of the challenges faced just in the 20 years he's been here. Just, you know, in our country, how much is different than just 20? 20 years ago isn't that long. I know little kids, it always seems like forever and a day. 20 years ago really wasn't that long ago. How different is our society today? What's allowed, what's condoned, what's promoted, all the things that we talk about on a regular basis. And, and all the called workers are, are faced to them, just as Paul was facing opposition in his day. Lots of things are going to change. And certainly when you think of Paul, something comes to mind. When you think of Pastor Wolf, something comes to mind. You think of every pastor, everybody downstairs on that wall next to all the confirmation pictures. Something's going to come to mind. But isn't it mostly did they share what God says? That's what you call every pastor to do. And that's what the pastor, in turn, tells you to do. Because that's the mission that God has given all of us. God equipped Paul with the message. God has equipped the called workers of today with his message. He equips all of us with his message. And he's going to work with all of our weaknesses. We're going to have them. We're not perfect, holy, almighty God. No called worker is, no member, no believer is. And it's great and wonderful as the heroes of faith are, Old or New Testament of the Bible, they're all exactly like you and me, that they sin, need a Savior, and have one. And life is all about that Savior, not just us. Quite a few years ago at the pastor's conference, one of the pastors got up and he asked a question. He said, how come church members never remember their pastors for their law gospel sermons. And I'm looking at him like, well, isn't that what we're all supposed to be? <laughs> isn't that the one thing we should all have in common? Some are going to be very short. Some are going to be very tall. Some of them are going to be your age. Some of them are going to have kids your age. Some of them might live next door to. You're going to interact with them differently depending on the way all of those things work out. Those things are going to make them all different. And that'll make Paul different from Pastor Wolf, from me, from John the Baptist, anybody else you can put in that list. What makes them alike? God equipped those messengers with a message. And that's, what you, that's actually what's in the call. You as a congregation extend the pastors. You can come and you can be the pastor here if you will use the Bible and you will use God's word. That's what God sent Paul to do. That's what you commissioned Pastor Wolf to do. That's what we're asking everyone to do. Take the message not just about the messenger and what what really is the message we're presenting the one thing we need to present what was the number one thing paul said you have a savior he spoke very violently against work righteous against save yourself against the judaizers really against his former way of life because it contradicted the message god had in his word he said this one that i held before doesn't save 
This one does in any and every situation. And that's what God had Paul present. That's what Pastor Wolf's been presenting for his ministry. That's what all the called workers do. That's what your teachers do across the street, your Sunday school teachers, VBS, when we can have those, you know, COVID permitting and all those things. That's what we do. Present the gospel. Because only in the Bible do we have that message. Everything else contradicts that message. Everything else says you and I are the guilty ones, so we got to do something to make things right. But we can't. We can set up human terms uh, that, that'll satisfy a debt. doesn't satisfy God's. And there's no reason for us to, because Jesus already did. While you're presenting the gospel, there will be the law so that people recognize why we need a Savior and God's, God's lasting will for our lives. He wants us to obey Him. He wants us to be the light of the earth and the salt of the world so that we can present that Savior to him and what God says is right and wrong. But presenting, a God giving this message to his messengers, it's really, are they going to see Jesus? Are you giving them the hope and joy and peace that God himself has provided by taking it on himself to live and die for you and me and Paul and everybody else? That's the only peace, the only source of the peace. And that's why God has to equip the messengers. The ones who have been doing it for a while, the ones who are just starting now, the ones who are studying to become public called workers in the future, it's all about the message. You're certainly going to recognize the face and appearance and the personality and all those things. And we're gonna remember all those things in their life like we remember about Paul's and all those things. But what's the one thing God wants us to remember? There is a Savior in Jesus. And God worked through Paul to speak to how many? Even though Paul found something that he didn't like. He wanted to change something. He figured whatever this physical ailment was that he speaks of here, if God would just remove that, and at least three times he's pleading, take this away from me. Really not for himself, is it? By that time, Paul's not doing it about himself. He said, if you take this from me, look what I can do for you, God. And God says, the message that I've given you is enough. We don't need anything else. We may want that. And it's certainly not wrong to want to excel in everything. But honestly, I can't, nobody else can. Are you going to be perfect at everything? Everything you ask your teachers to do, your pastors to do, everything God tells us, is everybody going to do that perfectly, better than everybody else? Not going to happen. We should excel, or try to excel as best as we can and be the best we can, recognizing this is how God made me. And God made Paul with this thorn he speaks of. And he says, I know, I get it. It's a burden, it's a pain. You, rec you think you can do even more for me than what you're doing if I take it away? But what you're doing is serving the purposes I've given you, and somebody else is going to do it there, and somebody else over there. And that's why God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Kind of this, this two-sided thing that the devil works on. He kind of gets this thing... We're all great. We're good. Everything good about us. God's going to take us to heaven because we're just good people. Because everybody likes us. We have a lot of friends. We have a lot of power. Everything's going. We've got things in order. He gets us to think that, or he gets us to think the exact opposite. I'm nothing. I'm nowhere near like him, and I don't have what they have. I can't do what they do. God says, whether you think you've got this all together or you think it's not there at all. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Everywhere Paul went, he had to live down all those things we mentioned earlier about being Saul, didn't he? Everybody knew him. He went to Damascus. God told Ananias, go over there to Straight Street and put your hands on Saul. And these things, these things like fish scales are going to fall off his eyes. And I want you to baptize him. God, you want me to go there? Everybody knew who Saul was and what he was there to do. And everywhere he went, people knew who he was 
and what he had done. And God said, I'm going to use you anyway. Because Saul, Paul, wasn't saving anybody. He was presenting how God, through Jesus, did. And that's your comfort and mine. God says, I will give you this message to share in your homes, to share in your church, to share in your schools, and anywhere else as we have that opportunity and ability to do so. Recognizing his grace is what this is all about. That's where the power is. Anything that I do well as a pastor isn't about me, is it? It's about God. It's about his word. We can do a bunch of other things together, like we said before, you know, you got kids the same age and all that. We can interact that way. That won't get anyone to heaven. What will? Believing that message God has preserved for us to share. That's what qualifies us to be messenger. Some publicly in the name of the church, but really all of us sharing that one message of God's grace which alone provides peace. So going forward, we continue to pray for all called workers, for all Christians, for those studying to do this publicly, for those who have a, a real challenge in their personal lives presenting and living this message. We ask God to fill us with his spirit so that we can reflect that same saving light to others that he's first given us. Like Paul says, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The peace of God which passes our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we respond to God's word by singing the Create in Me Offertory. The music's on page 20 in the front part of the hymn. Almighty God, we praise you for the great company of saints who have finished their lives in faith and now rest from their labors. Today we remember our brother in the faith, John Dahlberg, who you called to yourself a week ago and who received a Christian funeral on Friday, whom, the, whom you have redeemed by the blood of your son and received as your dear child through holy baptism. We thank you for giving him to us as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your compassion, comfort all who continue to be sad in this hour. We also praise you, Heavenly Father, for your gracious gifts to us. We thank you for establishing and maintaining the holy ministry to nourish a congregation of believers with your precious word. You have done great things for us, and we are glad. We lift our hearts in gratitude for the goodness you have bestowed on Pastor Wolf, whom you've called as a pastor of our congregation and other congregations throughout the years of his public ministry. <laughs> In spite of all human frailties, you've enabled him to teach your saving truth among us. As a wise and faithful steward of your mysteries, he has declared the whole counsel of God. You've given him strength to bear his burden of labor and hardships and supported him when crosses weighed heavily. 
For this abounding love and favor toward your servant, we thank and praise you. In your goodness, grant him continued guidance and sustain him with your tender care and give him joy in serving your people and fill his heart with your peace. We also ask your blessing on all those who continue to make preparations for the public ministry that by your grace we may flood the world with the light of your gospel. We bring these and all things before your throne of grace with the confidence that you will hear our prayers and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. We also ask that you hear us as we join again to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. May they strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting and keep you at peace with God. Amen. Please stand for the closing prayers. give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we close our worship, hymn 281. 